morning. Happy Monday. I'm Erin Brinker. And I'm Tobin Brinker. And we are on the brink. The morning show on KCAA AM 1050, FM 106.5 and FM 102.3. So glad to have you with us on this Monday morning. Can't believe it's Monday. The, we- the weekend seemed to go really quickly. Yeah, I love this time of year though because for me, the, the, I'm looking. I'm like three more weekends and then the school year's done. Woohoo! Woo-hoo. Well, yeah, and what is it? Two more weeks. Well, in two weeks, our son's getting married. Yes. Which is crazy. Yes. It's just crazy. Yes. <laughs> crazy. And in five weeks or four weeks, how many weeks till our daughter's getting married? Uh, five. Four. Four. Four weeks. Four? My goodness, yeah. Yeah, four weeks, our daughter's getting it's married. going quick. Insane. Yeah. Insane. Love so, those kids, though. Yeah. Excited for both of them. I'm excited for both of them as well. Um, uh, so this past weekend, uh, well, on Friday, Tobin and I, he's shaking his head. So, okay. <clears throat> this past weekend, we had a good weekend. Tobin, you went on a run on Sunday. I did. I did. I went uh, six miles, three miles up a mountain and three miles down. And my legs are so sore today. Oh, I got old man syndrome. You do? Yeah. Well, it's because I haven't been trill, uh, trill? I haven't been hill training. Yes. Trill haining. Yes. I have not been (laughs) hill training. And so I really struggled on the uphill parts. I did a lot of walking. But uh, glad I did it and I finished. And my time really wasn't that bad. uh, Compared to last year, I think I was like maybe a minute or two slower. So, you know, and last year I really had trained. So I don't feel like I've had that much of a fall off. In my abilities. So, so this weekend, Tobin and I watched a lot of um, Acorn TV. And so we, uh, yes, we were slugs. Just, I'm going to put it out there. You know, after a really, really busy couple of weeks, we did nothing but watch television. Yeah, we did. We, we got a lot of housework done. We too, did. Though. We did get some housework done. Yeah. And, uh, we, you know, grocery shopping and laundry and all those things that have to happen. I say grocery shopping. I used to Instacart. <laughs> <laughs> they brought it to us. They it's brought awesome. it to you know what? It, not having to deal with the grocery store on a Sunday when I just I just wasn't up to it. But we watched so I love these shows. I watch Acorn. Now if you guys if if you have Amazon Prime, you have access to you can get um HBO and Stars and Showtime and Acorn and a few others through Amazon Prime, these these services that you pay for. And Acorn, for those of you who are going like, A hey, what? What? What what? It is all this it's it shows from the Commonwealth countries the British Commonwealth countries, <clears throat> which would be obviously the UK, uh, Canada, um, uh, New uh, Zealand, Australia, um, and a f- I think, you know, there's other Commonwealth countries yes. around the world. And so we've been watching these Australian shows mostly, and, well, in New Zealand, and uh, yeah, one crime procedural after another, and they're just fun. Yes. You know, I just really enjoy them. So it's like $5 a month for Acorn. You should totally check it out. I'm, and they're not paying me or anything. I just really enjoy the programming. Yes. And we also did a little bit of party planning for my 50th birthday. We did. We, we did a beer tasting. We <laughs> Yeah, that part was really hard. Tobin yeah. struggled. You know, he didn't want to go, and uh, he fought no, me every no, step of the way. No. It was funny because we were we had, we had lunch with our son and his fiance, and my son talked about how he loved the uh, the cake tastings that they went on uh, throughout the the wedding planning process. Yes. That was like his favorite thing. And so <laughs> I'm like, well, my fiftieth is coming up, and we want to have beer there, so we should do a beer tasting. We should do a beer tasting. <laughs> <laughs> It was, good. Uh, it was, yeah, and, you know, and we went out to eat. Basically, we spent a lot of money this weekend. Yeah. You know, going out to eat and going beer tasting and that kind of stuff. Yes. So, but it's good for the local economy. Um, Rosie O'Donnell, spending, speaking of spending money, has found herself in some hot water. Yeah, you know, this is one of those funny stories because um, uh, she overspent the campaign uh, amounts that you're allowed to by the uh, the FEC, the Federal Election Commission, and... You know, of course, Republicans are crowing about this, you know, oh, look how immoral they, you know, and the Democrats, they're the ones who wanted these campaign limits, you know, because, you know, the, the, you know, it's corruption if people give too much money and, and that then she's a diehard Democrat. And of course, she's violating it. Of course, the irony of it is, is Republicans have argued for years that we shouldn't have these limits. Right. So for them to be sort of poo pooing this or going, you know, what a horrible thing. Um, and I think they're just pointing it out because, of course, she's a Democrat and violating sort of a Democratic mantra, which is that campaign limits are a good thing but 
So Rosie O'Donnell could be in trouble with the FEC, the Federal Election Commission, um, according to the New York Post, um, and she because she has regularly exceeded the legal limit in donating to progressive Democrats running for office. According to the Post, which conducted an extensive investigation of candidates' FEC filings, O'Donnell has routinely donated more than, than the FEC allows, a mere $2,700 per candidate per election cycle. Donors are free to give amounts exceeding that $2,700 limit to super PACs and other organizations supporting the particular candidate, but limits must limit all personal donations. Using the online donation platform Act Blue, O'Donnell admits to donating to candidates who vocally oppose Donald Trump's agenda, but says she assumed that if she donated more than the legal limit, the candidates would return the money. Mm-hmm. To that end, she gave um, Alabama Senator Doug Jones, who challenged R- Judge Roy Moore, about 2,000 more than, the was, than what was legal. She gave Pennsylvania Representative Connor Lamb, who won a special election again a special election last March, 900 more than that was allowed, and just the begin- that's just the beginning. O'Donnell says she gave more than $50,000 to candidates in just the last cycle. O'Donnell claims the overages were all a mistake. I didn't know. It was, you know, it was, I, I, it was, I, just, I just made an error. Telling the Post she did nothing nefarious. I was not choosing to overdonate. It was just an accident. She fell on the computer and, and, and tripped and just happened to fall on that submit button. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, the $2,700 cutoff should refund, the, you know, the candidates uh, should refund the money, she wrote. I don't look to see who I can donate most donate uh, most to. I, don't, I just donate assuming they do not accept what is over the limit. That is such a cop-out. I'm sorry. So, so a part of that is, is true if you are the casual donor who's never donated before, right? You wouldn't know those things. But she's a woman who donated fifty thousand dollars just in the last cycle. Right. Right. So she's not your casual donor. She should know these things, and um, and then she comes up with a secondary sort of dodge, which is that her brother Tim handles her finances, and he's the one who actually made the donations. Right. So she threw and her brother Tim under the bus. She did, and and she throws Act Blue under. You know, they should have a, a button on there that only allows it's you to do It's not my max. fault. I'm not responsible for my behavior. All yeah. these other people are responsible for my behavior. Yeah. Now. For me, the kicker, though, is like in the fine print here, apparently when she made these donations, four out of the five, she came up with different ways of spelling her name and five different addresses <laughs> that she put into the system. <laughs> so that had she put in the, the same name and the same address, I, the system would have said to her, sorry, you're uh-huh. donating too much. Uh-huh. So she probably got that message and then said, well, we'll just change the name. What the a address. slime ball. Yeah. And so it's, it's clear that there, there was, an I think in my mind, there was an intent here to over donate uh, now uh, the, the reality is as though the FEC doesn't usually take these situations all that seriously when it's a small dollar amount and and so you know if she was donating millions of dollars over then she'd probably be going to prison or something but you know these are a couple couple thousand couple hundred for these individual candidates so she's gonna get slapped on the wrist the candidates are probably gonna have to refund the money or put it into some other account Okay, but here's the thing. I want to go back and see, you know, how many times she railed against Stormy Daniels and Donald Trump, yeah. right? Because when that comes right down to it, it's probably whether the, that 130000 whatever was a campaign donation, and mm-hmm. that's that's going to be the I crux know. of the issue. Uh, and so uh, if she uh, yelled uh, and screamed uh, uh, about uh, uh, Donald Trump and Stormy Daniels, Daniels, because really, who the heck cares if Stormy Daniels was paid off? Yeah. Uh, you know, honestly, Stormy Daniels needs to be sued by Donald Trump for violating her NDA. She took yeah. the money. Yeah. Um, but if if Rosie O'Donnell was, you know, flapping her gums over that one, then she needs to be gone after as well. Yeah. I just it just drives me crazy this hypocrisy. Well, that's the whole system. That's why I, I can't I can't stomach you know the Democrats or the Republicans right now because both parties are just pointing the finger at everyone else. See, they do it too. They do it too. And I'm sorry, someone's got to just stand up and say, yeah, it's wrong. Yeah. Yeah, we made a mistake. That was bad. And let's change. Let's be better. <laughs> so with that, it's time for a break. I'm Aaron Brinker. And I'm Tobin Brinker. And we'll be right back. Every day is a great day at KCAA Radio. May 1st is Law Day. The U.S. observes Law Day annually on May 1st. This day allows all Americans to reflect on the personal rights and liberties which are enjoyed and exercised daily. These same rights and freedoms are upheld by the laws and courts. Law Day is meant to reflect on the role of law in the foundation of the country and to recognize its importance for society. May 2nd is National Truffle Day. This chocolate confectionery is traditionally made with a chocolate ganache center coated in chocolate. Icing 
dressing, cocoa powder, chopped nuts, or coconut. The truffle may be filled with other fillings such as cream, melted chocolate, caramel, nuts, fruit, nougat, fudge, toffee, mint, marshmallow, or liqueur. May 3rd is National Two Different Colored Shoes Day. National Two Different Colored Shoes Day was created by Dr. Arlene Kaiser. Kaiser created this day to recognize and celebrate human diversity. According to Kaiser, the simple act of wearing two different colored shoes proclaims your individuality. By taking this positive risk, you can demonstrate your willingness to be different and show your appreciation for the unique people in your life. May 4th recognizes National Orange Juice Day. America's most popular breakfast drink, people have been waking up to a glass of orange juice for many years and enjoying the health benefits it gives them. One eight ounce serving of orange juice has 124 milligrams of vitamin C and also supplies potassium, thiamine, and folate. That little bit of sunshine in the morning can add a boost to your day. Another excellent way to add orange juice to your diet if you are watching your sugar intake is to include it as an ingredient in a recipe. Orange juice can add great flavor to smoothies, whole grain waffles, or French toast. And also, for all you sci-fi fans out there, don't think I forgot, may the fourth be with you. For KCAA, NBC News Radio, 1050 AM, The Legacy, 102.3 FM, and 106.5 FM, I'm Andrew Caravella, and this has been The More You Know. What if I told you you'd never have to make a house payment again? What if you could pay off much needed home repairs and even create an income stream based on the value of your home? If you're 62 years old or older, you could be eligible for a reverse mortgage. Call Tim Harrison and find out if a reverse mortgage is right for you. Call Tim at 800-566-2475. That's 800-566-2475. Tim Harrison, branch manager, NMLS number 170960. Broadview Mortgage Corporation is licensed by the Department of Business Oversight under the California Residential Mortgage Lending Act, license number 170952. Registered with the Nationwide Mortgage Licensing System and registry number 813B544. Broadview Mortgage, equal housing lender. Remember, if you never want to make a house payment again, except for property taxes, maintenance, and insurance. That's 800-566-2475. That's 800-566-2475. Locals in Loma Linda and Redlands all know and love the Family Homestyle Cafe, the home of the world's largest pancakes and the delicious mouth-watering food cooked up daily by their well-trained chefs. Sizzling thick-cut bacon, ham, and hand-pressed sausage. They take pride in the best quality, great economical values, with better portions served up with the pride of local ownership and great service. Near the corner of Anderson and Redlands Boulevard in Loma Linda, if you haven't tried out Chef Mark's Delights, you haven't had some of the best food in the area. And now, Chef Mark is upgrading his cafe and offering space for on-site gatherings, luncheons, and parties. Add a DJ for a great holiday party or luncheon, and you've got a no-fuss event with all the bells and whistles. Call Mark today at 909-478-9996. That's 909-478-9996. Or stop by the Homestyle Cafe in Loma Linda at Anderson and Redlands Boulevard. KCAA, where every day is a great day. Today is gonna be the day that they're gonna throw it back to you By now you should have somehow realized what you gotta do I don't believe that anybody feels the way I do about you now Welcome back. I'm Erin Brinker. And I'm Tobin Brinker. And we are on the brink, the morning show on KCAA AM 1050, FM 106.5 and FM 102.3. And John McCain is getting towards the end and um, coming clean. He is. You know, this man is one of my heroes. um, And I had the great uh, fortune to be a delegate to the Republican National Convention that nominated him for president in 2008. But my um, admiration of him began long before that. Um, uh, I supported him back in the 2000 election against George W. Bush. And uh, I can't help but think how better or how different our country would have been had he been our president um, either in 2000 or 
in 2008, and I'm sad that uh, both times he was unsuccessful. Um, I think about a lot about where our politics are today, and uh, and his role in that, you know, and it's it's uh, it makes me sad. It makes me sad. So he uh, he's uh, he's now come out and said that he regrets uh, picking Sarah Palin as his uh, running mate in 2008. Um, you know, although I understand why he did. I mean, I know that he was being yeah. pressured by uh, by the, co- real, the the conservative wing of the Republican Party because she had that real uh, conservative appeal. Yeah. Um, but what he, you know, she had the right look. She said the right things. That speech, whoever wrote that speech that she gave at the at the convention, yeah. that speech was amazing. Yeah, and I run. so wanted to like her because she seemed Reagan esque in her in her um, her charm and her wit, right? Yeah. Um, but but that's all there was to her. You yeah. scratch the surface, there was nothing there. She was a hollow Easter bunny. Yes. You know, just a little chocolate on the outside and nothing on the inside. Yeah. And and it was it it left him who he is, he is a a statesman. He he understands foreign policy in a way that very few people do. Um, he uh, really believes in the American experiment, and he believes in the American, you know, what we're doing here, the way our government is formed, what you know, all of that. And she just. She just spewed platitudes. Yeah, she was a person who had risen to the top of her state politics in Alaska. She was a governor, but really had never really sort of prepared herself for the larger stage. You know, and it was clear that she was, you know, very sort of of uh, lightly educated on a lot of issues. <laughs> this should say not educated. Yeah. She knew the talking points, and that was it. Yeah. And, you know, as soon as she was asked sort of any kind of substantial question, she basically had to punt, you know. And re- like you said, she would rely on platitudes and, and other things and, and really showed herself to be a lightweight. And, and that was just unbelievable. So everybody needs time to ramp up. And so I'll, I, and I wanted to give her that. I really yeah. wanted to like her. Yeah. And, I, and I wanted to give her that. But she, she seemed to lack the intellectual curiosity to learn about these subjects she knew what she, would, she would be asked about. Yeah. And she also lacked, you know, when you understand that you know what you're talking about, when the media try to, try to trip you up, and they yeah. did with the question about the Bush doctrine, because there really wasn't at that time yeah. a Bush doctrine, then she could have pushed back and said, you know as well as I do, there's not one single Bush doctrine. So what which one are you talking about? Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? She could have pushed back. Yeah. But she, because she was such a lightweight, she, uh, she couldn't. Yeah. You know, and uh, it's like you said, you know, it was kind of an evolving thing. She gave that great speech at the convention, and then she started doing the media rounds. And, it, you know, as it slowly began to unravel, the media just went into this absolute feeding frenzy. Oh, yeah. They, were, they, were, they were sharks. Yeah. And it, it's, it's always been fascinating to me. You know, the, the, the media, if a Democrat woman is running... They hail it as a great thing. If an African American is running on the Democratic side, it's a great thing. But if a Republican that is African American or female or any of those normal liberal groups uh, puts themselves forward, the media goes after them hook and tong in ways that they never do for Democrats. And I, I just find that fascinating. In in it was one of the many ways that the media's liberal bias gets exposed. You know? Yep, and I agree. Um, now, well, who he wanted to choose and who I wish he had chosen yeah. is Joe Lieberman. Yeah. Um, because a unity ticket. Yeah, a unity ticket. And, you know, he and Joe Lieberman had always been, had always worked well together. They'd known each other for decades. And that's, that's who his gut told him to pick, and he yeah. ignored his gut. I wish that he hadn't. Yeah, and, you know, the, the reason that he didn't is because Lieberman is, is uh, pro choice. And uh, the, the conservatives in the party said, if you do that, you're going to lose you know, a large chunk of Republican voters. Um, but he didn't have those Republican voters in the first place. Yeah. Because they, they don't support McCain. They find him to be uh, not conservative enough. Yeah. And, and, you know, but it would have, I think, sent a strong message about where our country needed to head after uh, two sort of really divisive presidencies of Clinton and Bush, right? And, and, and say, hey, we're going to head... We're going to create a, a government that's going to be inclusive of everybody, you know, and I think that would have been a, a brilliant move. And it also wouldn't have left a lot of space for Obama, you know, um, and uh, but he didn't do it. He didn't do it. He didn't do it. Although, you know, having said that, <clears throat> maybe it was for the best because then the the stain of the crash in 2008, which was decades in the making, yeah. the stain of the crash of 2008 wasn't on him. Yeah. This is true. 
but, um, the, but the crash the crash falls on on Bush. But exactly because because Bush was president. Yeah. And if McCain had been president, it would have been. Um, you know, like if he had gone, if he'd been elected in 2000 instead of Bush, let's yeah, just say oh, for the sake of, yeah. yeah, for the sake of, of argument that he would have been, uh, you know, in there for two terms, the stain would have been on on him, even though the, 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 what led up to that crash was, was two decades of policy changes and, yeah. and just bad behavior. Yeah. So it really wasn't, I mean, this, I, I, but I'm not sure the crash would have happened in 2008 on his watch. It may have, it may have happened later. I think a lot of it was accelerated by Bush's housing policies, um, and I'm not sure that McCain would have had those same policies. I also think that McCain would have handled the September 11th attack and the wars that followed very differently. Oh, I agree. That is that I agree with that wholeheartedly. Yes. Yeah. It would have it would have been much more strategic. Um, now J- McCain also um, uh, uh, has said that um, he doesn't want Donald Trump at his funeral, and I'm really glad that he said that. Yeah. Donald Trump was ruthless in you know in uh, in talking about McCain. Yeah, and ruthless in, in in a way that made no sense to me because McCain wasn't running against him, right? And you don't waste your time. You know, McCain had made a few comments about Trump, but you don't waste your time going after people like that. It's beneath it's beneath you as the candidate for president. And and Trump, you know, throughout his campaign has gone after anybody and everybody in ways that that are just, uh, uh, I believe, just disgusting. And to go after someone like McCain, and you know, and this is partly why this there was this never Trumper group that developed because his willingness to go after, you know, decent mainline Republicans. Um, and and one of the things that drives me crazy about the Republican Party is this name Rhino, Republican in name only. You know, when someone claims to be a Republican, it's a personal choice. And so for others that are in the party to say, well, you're not a real Republican, you know, after someone has chosen to be a part of the Republican Party and support Republican candidates to make donations, that just makes no sense to me, you know. Yeah, and that and um, um, he suggested that McCain had not, I don't know if you said this because I was answering the phone, um, that, that McCain had not served honorably yeah. because he'd been captured. What a lord of, load of horse pucky. Yep. So I am so excited. We have a guest on the line right now. Ian Bremer is a president and founder of the Eurasia Group and G, G Zero Media, editor at large at Global Affairs, uh, editor at large and global, global affairs columnist, apologize for time, and was recently named. LinkedIn's top influencer of 2017. He is the author of nine books, including the national bestseller, End of the Free Market in Every Nation for Itself. Bremer has been featured on CBS's uh, This Morning, MSNBC's Morning Joe, Fox News, CNN, and Time, the New York Times, and the Wall Street Journal. He has uh, written a book. Um, let me let me give this quote. My favorite thinker on geopolitics offers a masterful analysis of why globalism crashed and populism has soared. This book book won't just help you predict the future of nations. It will play a role in shaping the future. He wrote Us versus Them, The Failure of Globalism. Ian Bremmer, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. So um, we're seeing this, but I think the, 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 the one that people really didn't see coming was, was Brexit. Nobody thought that would pass, but I think it's, it's signaling, you know, this frustration that people have with globalism. There's no question. Um, and it's so much broader uh, than what we see in the United States right now. It's across all of Europe, um, the, uh, the Italian elections, the German elections, even the French elections, where they voted for Macron, but that's because he got rid of the established parties. And the far left and the far right, the National Front, the Communists, uh, both did better in the first round than we've seen in decades. So this is, this is a wave of average people, working class and middle class people across all of the advanced industrialized democracies that are getting really angry with the idea of open borders, free trade, um, making the world safe for democracy, fighting wars all over the world. And, and technology is going to make it a hell of a lot worse. So let's talk about the United States because we are, you know, we've seen these uh, polarized ends, uh, the far left and the far right, that have really dominated American politics. But I think most people exist in the middle. And I think the tolerance for these, for lack of a better word, wackadoodles on each end, I think people are getting sick of it. There's no question. Um, they're, they're upset uh, at, at wackadoodles. Um, but if you think that you're being lied to for decades by the mainstream media, by government officials, by CEOs, and by bankers, 
your willingness to either check out and not vote at all, and let's face it, far more people didn't vote in this last election in the U.S., most important election of our lifetime, than voted for Trump or voted for Hillary Clinton, or your willingness to just vote protest and say, look, I want someone who's just going to shake things up, that's going to just show that I'm angry, I think those numbers are going way up. And that's certainly the community I grew up with in the project. My brother voted for Trump. My mother were alive. She certainly would have. They would have voted for Sanders. They probably would have voted for Obama, right? Uh, but the point is they just wanted someone from the outside, not another establishment person using their fancy facts uh, and their education, uh, but not doing anything for my community. So what are some of the top risks you see for Americans in the year ahead? Well, I mean, the big risks are the long-term ones, right? So the fact that the Chinese have a model, they have a Chinese dream. Nobody voted for Xi Jinping. It's an authoritarian system. But the average Chinese today feels better about a Chinese dream, feels it's more realistic than the average American feels about an American dream. And, you know, despite the fact that we have automation uh, that are, that's displacing huge numbers of workers, the Chinese has a system um, that actually uh, employs huge numbers of inefficient laborers. If they need to employ people to, you know, inefficiently dig ditches or, you know, build a bridge, they will. Where in the United States, you know, corporations, capitalism, you're just going to use the most effective route. And, and all of these things with a country that's about to become the world's largest economy, and for our entire lifetimes, we're used to the U.S. and our allies running the global economy, that's really going to make things a lot more difficult, uh, ultimately for the strength of the dollar, ultimately for the kind of lifestyle that we want ourselves to live. So do you think America is on a trajectory of things getting easier or, or worse? I mean, you brought up China. You know, Mao, China didn't start out where they are now. And I think Mao, he killed tens of millions of people um, to build this Chinese dream. And that's not at all what we have done. Absolutely not. And, I mean, it's not as if the United States is facing ruin. Uh, I think that it's, you know, the, the, with the extraordinary wealth we have, the oil production, the food production, we have two oceans and a couple of pretty stable countries surrounding us. We don't have the refugee issues that our allies in Europe do, for example, or the terrorism concerns that they have. So we have a lot of natural advantages, but those advantages allow us to avoid uh, responding to our problems until they get much bigger. And what worries me, and the reason I wrote this book, is we feel as divided as we do right now with an economy that's doing far better than at any point since the 2008 financial crisis and with unemployment levels that are as low as they've been at any point since 2000. And yet we feel bad now. Like what's going to happen when we hit a recession? What's going to happen with all of the CEOs I talked to in the United States telling me in the next 10 years they think they can make a lot more money with fewer employees? What's that going to mean for the average American if we don't have a government that starts actually investing in these, those Americans that are getting displaced? So what do, you, what do you recommend that the country do? I mean, what, what policy recommendations can you make? Well, instead of talking about building a wall every day, which Trump does, I'd like to see much more focus on infrastructure, right? I mean, infrastructure week became almost a joke, um, in uh, the butt end of a joke, in talking about it right now because nothing's being done. But... You, if you've got, I mean, this isn't a magic wand. I mean, if you have an educational system that isn't training people to have the kind of jobs that are emerging, then they're going to be angrier. If you have a government that continues to fight wars and send the poorest people out to be engaged and they come back and the Veterans Administration doesn't work, they're going to get angry. You need to fix that stuff. But if our government isn't going to fix that stuff because it's really divided and because our politics are short-term and because we spend billions of dollars on our elections every couple of years, um, then the, the solutions end up being smaller. And I think where I see solutions coming in the next five years in the United States are from mayors, they're from some governors, they're from some CEOs, they're public-private partnerships between universities um, and the private sector that are, you know, they're, they're, we need a lot of experimentation. If the government is not going to recognize that structural inequality is leading to solutions like the far right and the far left, or populists who are going to break things, or Donald Trump who says America first, and long-term isn't good for the country, then we have to have a lot more experiments at the local level to see what's going to work. And that's, that's really what should give us the most motivation long-term, because we are ultimately a very entrepreneurial country and entrepreneurial people. 
So populism has has brought around or brought about p- political movements that have not ended well. Uh, Hitler was a populist. Um, Hugo Chavez was a populist, um, uh, and and even closer to home, Andrew Jackson was a populist, and that led to the Trail of Tears. Um, is is Will it take a better leadership from the top? And I know that this groundswell, this kind of grassroots politicians, offices that are closer to the ground um, than the president um, are, will need to make the change. But what about how people view their federal government? Yeah, I mean, the, the danger is that um, four years or eight years of the Trump administration is going to weaken American institutions, it's going to make government less effective. We see that very few people want to work in the State Department today. Right, so you, the quality of our diplomats in 10 and 20 years will be a lot lower than it used to be. Um, the willingness of Trump um, to go after the Department of Justice, the FBI, will weaken uh, the effectiveness of those institutions over time. And so it's becoming hard. The free media, you know, they, they bang on about every single Trump tweet, and they're so angry with him. And it has weakened. They've gotten more money. They get more eyeballs. But it's weakened their legitimacy as you know, sort of strong institutions that report the news and do real journalism. And so, you know, it doesn't, we we can handle three months, six months, a year of this, but over time, you are actually eating seed corn, right? Uh, The the, the hope that, you know, over time, these things are going to grow and get stronger. It's very, it takes a long time to build strong institutions. It's much easier to break them. And right now, uh, we're not doing a lot of building in the United States. Right now, we're doing a lot of eroding. Wow. So you say, um, do you think governments will want to uh, to um, have tighter controls? Do you think that, you know, we've, we've we, and, and Trump has certainly said he wants to crack down on free speech. He's kind of backed off of that recently. But, you know, with, uh, you know, everybody thinks everybody's lying and every and there's a real push against, quote unquote, hate speech. Do you think tighter controls and less freedom is coming? Well, we know that it, it's working in China. Right, in the sense that it, they have a system called social credit, which is, you know, you have a credit score in the United States and you do or don't get a mortgage on the basis of whether or not you're seen as an economic good bet. Well, in China, social credit is a lot broader than that. You get economic opportunities and, and liberties, like can I get on a train, can I get on a plane, can I travel, on the basis of not just how you do economically, but also how you behave what kind of people you associate with online, if you ever participate in a demonstration, what do you read, what do you post? Now, I mean, that that is proving a system that is very powerful at supporting a central Chinese state. Now, in the U.S., we obviously don't do that. But in the U.S., we're becoming more divided because the companies that are behind what we read, like Google and Facebook, they're not media companies. I mean, they're much more about it's, it's all about the advertising, and they're only going to feed us individually the things that we like. And those things that we like, if we're on the left, are going to be all left. And if we're on the right, they're going to be all right. So they, that's really facilitating uh, dividing the average American from one another and undermining the civic nationalism and the melting pot that we thought we grew up with during the Cold War. Yeah. Well, uh, you're also starting to see, you know, Facebook is is actually kind of seems to be morphing into a uh, into a, a media company instead of a platform. And I say this because they're changing their algorithm so that they're serving up different content, which means they're controlling content in a different way. Um, and do you think there are going to be ramifications on that on that front? I do. I, I think that when the world's largest advertising company is the one that determines what kind of information citizens consume, that's a pretty dystopian outcome, right? I mean, you know, there's nothing wrong with having um, companies give us information, but you kind of want everyone to be reading the same news, having access to the same newspaper, access to the same TV show. But when it becomes micro-targeted so that you're only, you know, going to read and see the stuff that you already agree with because that makes you happier, well, that's the equivalent of only eating the food as a kid that you're screaming for. So it's more fat, more salt, more sweet, and we end up with the most obese nation um, in the world, the most type 2 diabetes. Well, what happens when companies, you know, instead of feeding the body or feeding the body politic that way, 
well, you're going to get equivalent outcomes politically, and that's exactly what's happening in the United States right now. So do you think that this this time of unrest globally, because we're certainly seeing unrest globally, um, is it, it, do you see it changing in the, in the near future, or do you think we're, go, we're, we're in for the long haul for a while? I mean, I wrote this book precisely because it's clearly going to become a much bigger issue. Um, and I say that because if it feels this divided now with the economy doing so well, and we know that the technology piece is new, it's just in the fi last five years, that we've seen all this, the beginning of the displacement of workers from AI, it's only in the last five years that social media has become dominant in terms of how we consume information. We don't know how to deal with it yet. Those trends imply that the next five, ten years are going to be very deeply divisive. And it's going to happen at the very time when China becomes the largest global economy. So I think that, uh, I mean, I don't think we're heading for World War III, but I think we're heading for a time when our institutions and our values are going to be very deeply challenged. Wow. Well, Ian Bremmer, everybody needs to read this book. It's Us Versus Them, The Failure of Globalism. How do people find you? Are you on social media? Um, and are you doing a book tour? I certainly am. Uh, and we've, uh, we're promoting the book all over the place. Uh, they can follow me personally at Ian Bremmer, uh, I-A-N-B-R-E-M-M-E-R, -E -E on Twitter, on LinkedIn, uh, or on Facebook. Uh, also, G Zero Media uh, is where we're putting out, you know, sort of all of the content for all of your listeners. And, and, of course, the book on Amazon or uh, bookstores near them, hopefully they haven't closed yet, uh, Us Versus Them, The Failure of Globalism is the name of the book. Ian Bremmer, this has been a treat. Thank you so much for joining us today. Great to be with you. So with that, it's time for a break. I'm Erin Brinker. And I'm Tobin Brinker. And we are on the brink, the morning show on KCAA. We'll be right back. KCAA Loma Linda, 1050 AM, K292 FQ Riverside, and K293 CF Moreno Valley. NBC News Radio, I'm Richard Jordan. Rudy Giuliani says President Trump wants to testify in the special counsel investigation, even though that could create a lot of problems for the president. Giuliani on ABC's This Week. I never thought 130000 was a real payment. It's a nuisance payment. Uh, when I settled this uh, for when it was real or a real possibility, it's a couple million dollars. Giuliani says he hopes he gets a chance to tell Trump about the risk he'd take if he speaks with the special counsel. Emergency officials on Hawaii's Big Island are telling families to go now. The Kilauea volcano continues to threaten a subdivision where lava has already destroyed more than two dozen homes. Iran's president says his country is ready if President Trump pulls the U.S. out of the 2015 nuclear deal. GoDaddy is pulling the plug on the website altright.com. Hello, I'm Johnny Cash. And Johnny Cash's boyhood home is joining the National Register of Historic Places. Richard Jordan, NBC News Radio. It's time for traffic on KCAA. I'm Erin Brinker. In Corona on the 91 westbound before 6th Street, an earlier crash is now along the right shoulder. There's stop and go traffic backed up from McKinley Street. The 71 south is slow between Euclid and the 91. In Upland on the 210 eastbound before Mountain Avenue, a crash, a trash can rather, is bouncing around in lanes. In Ontario on the 10 westbound before Archibald, a wreck is now along the right shoulder. In Eastvale on the 215, I'm sorry, the 15 northbound at Limonite, a crash has been moved to the right shoulder. Slow traffic is backed up from the 91. Overall, northbound traffic on the 15 is heavy from Lake Street. In the Cajon Pass on the 15 northbound at the 138, a four-car smash-up remains on the right shoulder. And also in the Cajon Pass on the 15 southbound after the 138, a big rig is along the right shoulder with a brake fire. Slow traffic is backed up on uh, from the 395, which is Joshua Street, and southbound traffic remains busy down toward Kenwood. This has been your traffic report on KCAA. We are the stations that leave no listener behind. I'm Aaron Brinker. From the KCAA Weather Center, I'm Alvin Washington. Sunny, hot, and windy to San Bernardino today. Look for a high of 90. Mostly clear tonight, low 57. Sunny, hot, windy once again Tuesday, 91 the high. Clear Tuesday night, low 59. Sunny and hot Wednesday, high 91. I'm Alvin Washington broadcasting live from the Tri-City Center at the 10 and 210 freeways. We are the trifecta of talk in Southern California. KCAA 102.3 FM Riverside, 106.5 FM Redlands, and the Legacy 1050 AM Loma Linda San Bernardino.
Here's Replete Vegan Skincare founder, Elizabeth Thoreau. Investing in your beauty is investing in quality of your life. The secret is in Replete Spring Serum Complex. It puts elasticity back in your jawline contour for completely remodeling the effects of winter. It improves firmness. It gets rid of sagging and wrinkles. And it puts the smoothness, radiance, and freshness you want in a spring day. RepleteSkinCare.com for your skin to look and feel its best. If you're looking for a full or part-time sales position and you have radio, TV, or print media experience, KCAA has a great opportunity waiting for you that pays the highest commissions in the market. KCAA is the only station in the IE that broadcasts on three frequencies, so advertisers receive three ads for one low rate. This makes KCAA a must-buy for every local business. If you're interested in a sales position with us, email CEO at KCAARadio.com. Redlands Bicycle Classic comes to town May 2nd to May 6th in the city of Redlands. Come and hear the roaring sound of bicycles zipping by spectators. Big Bear, Highland, Yukaiba, and Redlands all host this incredible... K-C-A-A Back, I'm Aaron Brinker. And I'm Tobin Brinker. And we are on the brink, the morning show on KCAA AM 1050, FM 106.5 and FM 102.3. I want to remind everyone how they can follow us on social media. I am Aaron Hunt Brinker on Facebook. Tobin is Tobin Brinker on Facebook. I am uh, at Aaron Songbird on Twitter. Tobin is Tobin Brinker on Twitter. <laughs> he did it right. I am Aaron Brinker on Instagram. He is Tobin Brinker on Instagram. It's easy because my name is unique and different. <laughs> Not a lot well, of me Well, okay, out there. so, and I wanted to put my maiden name in, I, there's already an Aaron Brinker on Facebook, and there was when I joined in 2007, but yeah. beyond that, I wanted my na- maiden name there so people could find me, people from, you know, because when, when Facebook really started taking off, um, uh, and I joined, you know, I joined when they were still throwing sheep at each other, remember that, throwing sheep? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, you wanted you wanted your friends, your you know high school friends or college friends that you lost in touch with, be able to be able to find you. Well, yeah. not everybody knew that my last name was Brinker, so I'm just saying. No, you you did it right. I, I agree. I mean, I I struggle sometimes when I'm looking for female friends from my past because yeah, their names have changed. They got it, married. It becomes very challenging to find them. So I took your name, and I'm proud that I did, but yes. I still want people to find me. I agree. <laughs> so um, on to something really real. I just. I'm kind of gobsmacked. It's kind of gross. This guy has eaten 30,000 Big Macs. 30,000 Big Macs. Dan Gorski has what? only missed eight days since his first Big Mac in 1972. Okay. He's 30, having a Big Mac a day? 30,000 Big Macs. How, what's he weigh, like 30,000 pounds? I know, right? A 64-year-old Wisconsin man has eaten his 30,000th Big Mac and not only has lived to tell the tale, but he claims low cholesterol and perfect blood pressure. Um, as, Fond du Lac reporter, uh, uh, as the Fond du Lac reporter reports, Don Gorski ate his first Big Mac in 1972 at the same McDonald's where he's he chowed down his 30,000th, and he's only missed about eight days in between. That includes a, 1980, uh, a 1982 day in which a snowstorm shut down the restaurant, as well as the day his mom died in 1998. She requested I not eat a Big Mac on the day she died in remembrance of her. Gorski said uh, he has. Gor- Gorski says he has OCD, which has led him to catalog thousands of receipts, wrappers, and containers over the course of more than four decades. So what he's saying is he's a hoarder, yes. and he doesn't appear to be suffering for his cause. Ellen DeGeneres had his cholesterol checked in t- 2003 and came up with and it came up with 140, and he's run a marathon with a big with Big Mac number 21,387 in his hand after consuming number 30,000. And he took one for the road. Maybe I'll be eating it when I catch myself on the news. Who knows? <laughs> wow. Right. 
Okay, so that is like some serious OCD if he has to go back every day and get a. a well, and not Big only Mac. that, but catalog it. I mean, because yes. I mean, if somebody were to ask me how many how many times I've eaten at McDonald's over the course of my life, yeah. first of all, we don't ever go to McDonald's. Yeah. You know, we do it a couple times in the summer to get ice cream, but we, we're just. And the other, like a month ago, I got a hankering for cookies and I went and got cookies. Right. But we're just, we just don't eat at McDonald's. But like as a kid and as a teenager and as a young adult, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I, how would no. I, you know, so it's not only that he ate that many, but he cataloged it and right. uh, saved wrappers and receipts and bleh. I know. <laughs> Count 30,000 wrappers. Oh my God. Can you imagine? No. So, Storing 30,000 wrappers. Yes. So there's another story that you told me about last night, and I felt like I was going to be sick just hearing it because, oh, my God. Right. So there's a woman, Aaron, who went into a 7-Eleven uh, to use their microwave. You know how they have the little microwaves you can heat up the little frozen yes. burritos and whatever? Yes. And um, apparently it exploded <laughs> and made quite a mess inside the 7-Eleven. Um, and what she was heating up, well, let's just say it was a little gross. Um, Colorado, Colorado woman has been cited by police after a container of what appeared to be urine Ew. blew up as she was heating it up in a Ew. microwave at a 7-Eleven. Police say the incident Ugh. occurred in the convenience store. <laughs> That's so nasty. Um, Aurora, in the convenience store chain's Aurora location last week when the clerk heard a loud bang and saw the 26-year-old Angelique Sanchez take a white plastic bottle out of the microwave. A police report says when confronted by the clerk, Sanchez wiped a yellow liquid that smelled like urine um, onto the floor and walked out. Okay. The report says an officer found Sanchez about a half mile away at a health clinic waiting for a urinalysis for potential employment. Um, when I reminded her that urine blew up where people prepare their food, she told me that it was not real urine, the officer wrote in his report. One theory is that Sanchez may have been asked to provide urine um, at or around body temperature for a drug screening test and nuked her sample to warm it up to body temperature, uh, says a medical expert. The, Den the Denver woman was issued a summons for damaged property. She could not be reached for comment. That's nasty. I'm sure that's what she was doing. It was somebody right. else's urine that was in her freezer or her fridge, uh -huh. and she wa wanted to warm it up right before she had to turn it in for drug testing. Uh-huh. So gross. And, you know, if you think about, like, all the people who maybe were waiting for that uh, microwave. And I'm guessing, because uh, the typical 7-Eleven setup is right where the microwave is. You also have, like, coffee creamers and cups. And, you know, this is where you prepare your food and your coffee. And, by the way, 7-Eleven has dynamite coffee. Yes. Um, but, uh, uh, and so all of that, all of that, I'm sure, had to be thrown away. And yes. Uh, whether the urine touched it or not. I mean, it's, you know, how do you know? you got to throw it all away. Everything has to be sanitized and sterilized. And, oh, my God. Right. It's just nasty. And I can't believe that she thought she was going to get away with it. Right? Like, I would imagine that somebody is going to look at that urine in there. Or when they do the urinalysis after it's been microwaved, and they're going to know something is not right. It's not going to be like normal urine. You know? Yeah. It's, yeah, that's just... I was laughing last night, but it was it, it it so grossed us both out. I know. Yeah, and so now her face is all over everywhere as the urine girl. <laughs> <laughs> right? Her mugshot is just like, oh, my God. Yeah. Huh. So on the other things biological, the cops have a surprise plan to identify the Zodiac killer. Oh, really? Yeah. So um, a police hope that new DNA technology will help. Uh, first, the Golden State Killer, now the Zodiac Killer, with DNA evidence possibly pointing to the former. To the former, police say the same method could be help, used to help identify the long-sought Zodiac Killer. Police in Vallejo, California, say they sent two employees from the Zodiac, uh, from the Zodiac Killer to. Uh, hang on. Uh, they. I just, they said two envelopes, not employees, yeah. envelopes from the Zodiac Killer to a private lab for a new kind of DNA analysis months ago. Any clear genetic profile will be given to a family uh, tree DNA service like the one used in the Golden State kill Killer case. But DNA from envelopes and stamps dating back nearly 50 years, can they still be used? It's definitely possible, says a forensic scientist. If they didn't steam the stamp off and it was stored in a cool, dry place, maybe there's sufficient DNA left. Vallejo Police Detective Terry Poiser, 
who's had the case for four years, tells the Sacramento Bee that people in the lab were confident they'd be able to get something off of it. In a surprise twist, lead suspect Arthur Lee Allen, an ex-school teacher and no child molester who died in 92, was cleared in 02 when an incomplete DNA sample from the envelopes didn't produce a match. Modern DNA technology should get a better sample, although Allen was known to get friends and neighbors to lick envelopes for him. So police may ask those people to submit samples. There are probably 30 different circumstantial things that point to Allen, says Poiser. He was extremely intelligent, but a deviant dude. Wow. Well, I hope they can figure it out. I mean, wouldn't that be fabulous, right, if they were able to uh, figure that one out? That's like, I mean, they've had movies made about that one and, you know. Yep. Um technology, Aaron. You can't get away, folks. If yeah. you are out there doing bad deeds, it may take a while, but they're going to get you. They're going to get you. Um, they're coming for you. They're coming for you. Bad boys, bad boys. Right. What you going to do? <laughs> right? <laughs> Speaking of bad boys, I was actually surprised to hear this story, and it was from Grand Terrace. It was close to home. Yeah. Um, uh, a man who authorities say beat up his pregnant girlfriend before barricading the two of them inside a Grand Terrace home was identified on Saturday as Henry Berrigan, who's 33. Dispatchers received uh, several 911 calls um, about uh, 12.30 p.m. on Friday from a woman crying and asking for help. Um, this is according to a, uh, a sheriff's news release. Berrigan was threatening to to hurt the woman and refused to let her leave the residence in the 11,800 11, block of Maple Avenue. Um, SWAT officers could not get a response from anyone in the residence, so shortly before 7 p.m., they broke in and rescued the woman who had a fractured nose and cuts on her face. Wow. Wow. So they got him. Yep. But uh, that's... He's arrested on kidnapping, inflicting corporal injury on a spouse or cohabitant. He's going to go to jail for a while. I sure Be- hope so. Beaten up on a pregnant woman? That actually happens more often than, than you'd like to, than you, yeah. than, than you think. Um, that, you know, the, the introduction of a baby, um, really, if you're, if, you're, if you're prone to that sort of behavior, yeah. um, often makes things worse. Now, not, I'm not justifying it. I'm just saying no. it's, it's lots of pregnant women get beat up by their boyfriends. Yeah, it's, it's uh, shameful behavior from that man. It's, um, uh, and, you know, there's a picture here of the SWAT officers. And the cost of all of that, right, to roll these guys out in their special uh, a tactical vehicle and, you know, to have them standing outside from basically 1 o'clock in the afternoon till 7 when they made entry, you know, the risks to all the people involved, the neighborhood and how all this effect. There's a lot of costs, and, and uh, this guy is going to, you know, he's got to pay for that, right? There's got to be some cost and consequence to that behavior that required all of that. And, I agree. Um, and beating her up. So I, I hope that uh, they really throw the book at him. So with that, we're at the end of our show for today. Have a wonderful Monday, everybody, and we'll see you tomorrow. KCAA Loma Linda, 1050 AM, 106.5 FM, and now 102.3 FM. I'm Chuck Kamlick, CNBC. Stock futures are higher. A busy week ahead for Wall Street. There could be news on a NAFTA deal. President Trump could also pull us out of the Iran deal. That's why 